Hi, Melissa Beck. Hi, Jess. How are you? Thank you so much for having me on your show. Of course. How are you today? I'm good. I listen to your podcast. I do. So no, I'm like really excited. Yes, I do. N- what, yes, did I you, do. what did you? What did you? What did you listen to? I well, you had Danny on, my I, beloved Danny. I did. Um, and then we have mutual friends. We so, do. and you know, women in podcasting, we got to support each other. So I love you. You were, <laughs> you know, I guess like my first, the first thought that I have is. MTV had your season along with many of the other iconic seasons like Hawaii and Boston. These seasons have been pretty much scrubbed from the internet, not available on streaming. And because you guys have the homecoming season coming out, they, for the first time in 20 years, Real World New Orleans, the original season, is finally available on streaming it just dropped and a whole new generation of people are going to discover you for the first time. Mm, I don't love it. I don't love that part. I I have like secretly been very excited that you have never been able to find the original show. Not because I'm ashamed of that show. I'm really proud of um, what that show offered to the world in terms of like pop culture and the important like topics we were talking about on our series. But I mean, it's like, you know, you hear yourself on a voicemail Mm -hmm. or you listen to yourself back on a podcast. You don't want to hear your own voice or see yourself. And like, that was a dreadful time, the early 2000s. What were we wearing? What is your take on the 2000s fashions? Like what you guys are, I mean, did Danny never change that turtleneck? He really never did. He either didn't have a shirt on or he had that turtleneck on. And I was like, wasn't it hot in New Orleans? (laughs) Um, No, the 2000s fashions were brutal. I don't know. And like, I was going through a very like vintage girl. I was wearing ascots. I had chopped all my hair off, which could have been cute, but I also didn't have a dental plan. I was wearing like the lens crafters on the lowest tier shelf. Um, (laughs) You know, like straight Costco glasses that you get for $48. Um, But you know, I was working with what I had at the time. And at least I had a perspective. I did. I, I, I thought I was doing something, but um, oh, you did. It's been you, really did crazy. you did something. <laughs> <laughs> Having gone back to the homecoming, like we realized that we're we're gonna this stuff is now going to live on the internet, and the internet is forever. So people have been sending me clips, things that I totally have forgotten that I did or said. And honestly, it's been like exposure therapy. Um, <laughs> both the process of going back to homecoming and now sitting here waiting for it to come on. It's been truly like exposure therapy because for so long, I did not want to look at any of that. And now I'm looking at it and I fondly remember that little girl. Mm -hmm. Like some of that stuff was funny and sure, you know, it's 2022 and some of the things we might've said or did don't hold up Mm -hmm. to today's, you know, standards of of what's good and right to say out loud. (laughs) But what is it it that you're so scared of? Like what, what is it that you're like, oh no, I don't want people seeing that. Like, is there a particular moment? Like what was it that you're sort of like shy or embarrassed about? My teeth. (laughs) Okay. Wait, okay. Speaking of your teeth on your Twitter, your header image is, is that your mouth? Yes. Those are my new teeth that I purchased. (laughs) Talk to me about your dental journey. Are you serious? Because I would really honestly love to. I'm super into teeth. I, I would not lie to you. Yes. Oh, this is so fantastic. No one's ever asked me. This This is the best interview I've ever had. Okay. Let's talk about it. So, um, after the show, I took all of my money from the real world. So they give you $5,000. So after taxes, it was what? 32, 68 and 74 cents. I don't know why I know that number. Let's actually underscore that you were paid. Well, all original real worlders. The salary was five grand for the entire season, which we're, let's get back to, let's get back to that. But I just want people to really let that sink in. Yes. So think about it. 5,000 us dollars to go and film this show pre-tax and then and then be that person from the real world forevermore mtv could put it on in brazil and israel in in ireland they can air it anywhere in the country and the the words in perpetuity were in perpetuity were in the contract which you know you're a 22 year old you don't know what any of that means but you're like yes i'll sign this contract and five thousand lumped us dollars was a lot of money at that time it's a lot of money now, but it wasn't a lot of money to be Melissa from the real world for no 20 years. So 5,000 US dollars. I took that money, deposited it. I had at the time a little 95 Honda Civic. The brakes were shot. I didn't fix the brakes. 
I said, it's okay, you know, let's just hope we can get from A to B out here on in Los Angeles. Let's hope everybody on Sunset Boulevard ain't mad at me when my car breaks down because I'm getting these teeth fixed. So I got braces um, for two years. And then I'm not even kidding you. I did the challenge. I came home from the challenge and fell off a flight of stairs, broke my brand new braced teeth. And from there have been on a teeth journey forevermore. So this is like my third set of veneers and my final set. I'm very happy with them. Shout out to Dr. Alex Rubinoff in Manhattan. <laughs> Here's my question about veneers. Well, I know that it's very expensive. Isn't it like a few grand per tooth? Yes. And, and you know, it's like I have like a Toyota Corolla in my face. Right. Yeah, you really do. Well, <laughs> yeah, you, you kind of do. Um, and is it painful? Um, well, getting, getting the process of g getting the veneers. It will be if you don't love teeth pain, but I'm also a total weirdo and I love it. Like my dentist at the time when I, I, I got these in um, September of last year. So, and it's a five hour surgery. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, they make sure you're comfortable. You have a weighted blanket, you have a headphone. Do they knock you, they music. don't knock you out? Mm -mm. And I didn't want to be, I want to feel everything. Ooh, I'd want to be completely knocked out. Oh no, but he was like, Melissa, are you like, is something going on with you? I said, what do you mean? He's like, I have never had a patient lay still and so relaxed for five hours. I, you didn't ask for a break. You didn't ask for a music change. You didn't ask for any of that. And I said, honey, please, we are on a journey to better living. <laughs> Give me all the teeth pain. Give me all of the beauty. I'll take it. So wow. um, yeah, the teeth thing was really very exciting for me. Um, it, I, I actually am very happy for my new teeth to make their debut that sounds so silly yeah right? they are making their debut listen think about what it is i mean now we're just talking about teeth in general and this is with all plastic surgery with anything that will make you feel better about who you are i support whatever it is that makes you look in the mirror and love yourself more i say you do that sure it can uh veer off into like dysmorphia mm -hmm. but whatever it is that makes you feel happy you should do that because i flipped through I've had a very full life since I did the show, but I have no pictures of it because I didn't love my smile. So like, I don't, I'm never in any of the pictures with my kids. And now my kids are like, please, mom, I can't take another picture with you. <laughs> Cause you just want, you just want those gorgeous teeth reflected back at you. Yes. I mean, listen, I, we got to get the money's worth. <laughs> All right. So I want to know your reaction to the come on, be my baby tonight remix is there a t i want to know if there's like a name because usually it's like the the dark underground remix i they, I, they have got to come up with a cool name what did you think when you was that the first time you heard the remix when you saw the trailer yes what and, was your emotional was, journey hearing that song well first of all going into this process i i was hoping that come on be my baby tonight would be featured heavily only because like think it's about it's like the real world Yes. Think about the real world New Orleans. I oftentimes say, come on, be my baby tonight is the eighth roommate. That song is what really put us on the map. Had David, who now goes by Tokyo, not been on the Chappelle show with that song. Honestly, it opened our viewership up so much. And I was really hoping that we would get to revisit that when we got there. So when the trailer came out and keep in mind, we come off of the show and we don't see anything. They just, you know, MTV goes, okay, thank you so much for your time. Have a great one. And then we're like, okay, but can we see clips? They're like, not really. You'll see it when it comes out. And you're like, but. So when the trailer came out, I really did love the trailer specifically because the ominous version of Come On Be My Baby Tonight was in it. And I was like, you know what? Pop culture wise, whoever's behind the scenes on the marketing or on just the whole tone of the show, I felt like they've got their finger on the pulse of like what people really want. Yeah. And people want to hear the song. It, it was just so good. Like, I don't even have the words. Like, I need, like, I hope they release it on on Spotify, like something. Like, I want Thank the you. full, I want the extended I need to own mix. the song. I'll pay the money. I'll pay the $1.99. No problem. Yeah, I'll pay $7.99 for that song. I will. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people need to understand that back in the day, in, two, in the year 2000, and when The Real World was first airing, MTV was playing this. 24 7 because it wasn't just mtv there was mtv too it was just around the clock so you were in a way for anybody who was watching mtv and let's face it that's anybody who was in my generation i graduated high school and my freshman year of college was the year 2000 the year that so this is the most formative year of my life so anything yeah. that happened in that year 
is just burned in my brain and I'm so emotionally connected to it as is anybody who that's what's happening during their high school and college years obviously so yeah I want to just like remind people like you were sort I mean like Danny you like you guys were like Ruthie from Hawaii you were absurdly famous to a select group of teens and you know college kids at that time I would say even I would say it's it's at that time it was anywhere between 11 years old to like 30 because wow. MTV was the barometer of everything that was cool. So if you were a very young kid and you had no business watching it, you would come home from school, fix yourself a little pop tart, however which disgusting way you did it, you put it in the toaster and you put butter on top of it even though it had already had enough calories. And you would sit in front of that television and you would be immersed in real world. And the only reason why I say that is because real recognized real. I was that kid too. I loved watching the show and I just really enjoyed learning about all of these like cool things that these young people, young adults um, would do. So I know a lot of times people um, talk to former cast members and a lot of times the cast members would be like, well, I didn't really know anything about the show. And it's just like, I did. And I have no shame about that. It pop culturally, the show is iconic. I don't care what nobody say. It it really laid the blueprint for what reality TV is today. And, um, you know, Buna Murray and MTV were pioneering in that. So we were incredibly famous, but also broke. And this was before social media. So this was before Twitter, before Instagram. There was no way for us to monetize that fame. So we are kind of like, these relics of a pop culture past. Um, And it's interesting because if you're watching the show now and you don't have that perspective, you can't really understand what that was. Because remember too, there was blogging, blogging was new. And I was like an early blogger. Princess, I used to read your blog, Princess Melissa. (laughs) That was up for a long, I swear to God, I remember at my very first job, I would read it. Oh, I used to go and look at the analytics and like, whoever like the assistants were at Simon and Schuster, every publishing house, like people were reading that blog, but I didn't have any idea of what that really meant. And it was also one of those things where, and I'm sure if you've interviewed other reality people where they'll, they'll, especially reality people of that era, where they'll say, yeah, the show was an opening and an avenue for me to get my foot in the door, but then you get your foot in the door and people like you, but they don't hire you. So it was a very weird time Um, but you know what, I'm glad that it happened that way because I was very famous, very young and I had to grow up really quick. You were like 22 when you did the show. Wow. Um, okay. So if you were like a huge MTV fan, like what were your favorite, I want to know your favorite seasons of the real world. And also like what other shows on MTV were you super into? Oh, I was a teen mom person. I watched every, remember True Life? I'm a whatever. Oh, yeah. All of the True Lives, especially the one where the guy got calf implants. I was just like, I didn't even know that was a thing. Remember that one trickle of blood, that iconic trickle of blood down the leg? <laughs> um, my sweet, my super sweet 16. That used to be about cribs. That used to be my shit. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of real world, I watched from the beginning. Like real world New York, loved it. Uh, LA, I watched all of them until mine. And then I fell off and wow. stopped watching after mine just because, you know, you kind of know what the secret sauce is. And you're like, hmm. <laughs> and were there any particular cast members that you super connected with? Like, so like, for example, I really connected with, I mean, the first person I, I mean, I've talked about this a lot on the show, like Genesis from Real World Boston was insanely form perhaps the most formative person for me as a teen because she was the first gay person I saw that where I thought oh like maybe I can actually be something in the world and Danny was sort of the next level of that like he was like the most gorgeous guy you've ever seen and he was talking about real issues like the whole don't ask don't tell so like those two were so you know personal for me who were those people for you well, I loved Ruthie just on the strength of being Filipino, you know, like, cause you don't mm-hmm. like, we talk about it casually now because we have so much of it, but back then, you know, hashtag representation matters wasn't a thing. So like you couldn't see yourself reflected back on you on a TV show. So you would attach yourself to these really famous people who 
you didn't really know anything about their story. So like Vanessa Manillo was coming up and she was a Filipino person. I didn't know anything about her, but yay, Filipinos, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, Ruthie was a Filipino on TV. And that was honestly, I was watching a real world Hawaii marathon when I decided to try out for the show because I started doing the math and I was like, huh, one brown person out of the seven, I feel like my odds are good here. Let's try this. But um, I've always loved Heather B. I was a Tammy Roman person. I was a mm -hmm. Cynthia person. I was a Dan Renzi person. Um, <laughs> Camila. Um, Camila is one of the, I interviewed Camila. She is one of the all time greats. Yep. And yeah, OBG and OBGYN in New York City right now. And Dan Renzi I know. Is, was a nurse on the front lines of COVID. Yes, I know. I And listen, and it's one of those things where, while I don't have a connection necessarily, like a close, you know, we're not at like a, a tight knit group of people, unless you like join the like challenge circuit. Mm -hmm. But like, it's one of those things where I understand what it means to be in this franchise. So I like root for everybody on Real World. I'm like really proud of anybody that has been able to either monetize it or move forward in their life in such a way where they process that experience in a healthy manner and are like living and thriving in a full whole life outside of TV. So like I see somebody like Jamie Chung who she can walk a red carpet and no one even knows she was on the real world. But then at the same time, I see someone like the Miz and I'm like, you know what, you go boy. He took that thing and he, he turned it all the way around. And I like, I was just like, go real world people go. I mean, I don't even know if people fully understand Karamo from Queer Eye. What he was the main cast. He, I mean, he was sort of like not a big player in it, but he was on Real World Chicago. I think yeah, it was Chicago. Was it? No, it was Philly. It was actually Philadelphia. I just read in the trades that he has a new daytime talk show that's going to take Maury's slot. So it's just Holy like, shit. go oh my boy. God. I'm so proud of him. I mean, wow. Queer Eye was already like tip top. I was so proud of him. Wow. I've never even met him. And I'm sitting here like, yes. Because I feel like it's a cool reflection on us, you know? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm ready for your daytime talk show. Um, okay. Who are you telling? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want you to walk me through your real world audition. Like, where were you living? Where were, yeah, where are you from? And like, where were you living at the time? You're like, hmm, like I could do this. And like, you um, auditioned. So my dad was in the military, so I'm a military brat. Uh, I was born in Japan, but then... Uh, the first time I lived in the States was North Dakota, but he, he retired in Florida. So I went to college and high school in a little tiny town outside of Tampa called Valrico. So I'm from deep South, you know, Florida sticks, like true swamp, strawberry fields, cow tipping. I come from the country because I had just gotten my degree um, and I tried out for the show. And back then the audition process was like lengthy. So it was many steps. It was you send in a tape that you make with a camcorder. I was recently on a podcast and the person that was interviewing me was so young that he didn't know what a camcorder was. So I was like, okay. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so you record a tape, you send it in and someone at Buna Murray saw my tape. And within two days of me sending that audition tape in, I had a call back and I was like, okay, this is weird. What did you do in the tape? Like, do you remember what you talked about? Yes. I sat down and I said, hi, my name is Melissa Howard, I'm half black and half Filipino. I live in Tampa. I got to get up out of here. You got to help me get out of here. That was basically <laughs> because I have always felt, I just never felt right in small town America. I didn't. After that, the audition process was going quick, quick, quick. And it went from, then you have to do a, a, a 60 page questionnaire and then you have phone interviews and then you got to go to, they had regional interviews. So then I had to drive all the way to Miami and meet somebody. Then from there, I went to LA, sat in a little hotel room for hours and hours and hours waiting for them to talk to me. And finally, when it came time to book me, and I heard Danny say this on your show, um, they had asked him to be on Road Rules. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually friendly with one of the old producers of the show at the time, Drew Tappan. And Drew Tappan was recently tweeting that um, Road Rules and Real World producers were arguing over Danny, like a heated argument over Danny. And Danny said, yeah, well, I'm not going on Road Rules. I don't know if they were a heated argument about me, but I too was offered road rules. And I was like, yeah, that's not, I'm not doing that. I can't outside. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Animals, sports activities. And eh. I'm more of a sit in the house and argue kind of person. So um, <laughs> uh, that was it. I, and when I got did, on the show. And when did you find out that the city was going to be New Orleans? I feel like I found out that it was going to be New Orleans very close to moving in. So there was a lot of time sitting there not knowing before going. I, I found out it was going to be very close 
And I was like, huh, what city could it be? And then it ended up being New Orleans, which I, where I had never been before. What what I I, I actually was in New Orleans. I mean, New Orleans is my favorite city um, in the United States, actually. And I, I've lived there for like small amounts of time, um, somewhat recently, actually. And what did your relationship become with the city? Like, did you feel like you got to really take advantage of New Orleans during the filming? Like, did you ever go back to visit after filming? Um, my first time back in New Orleans was actually to film Homecoming. So my first time back in New Orleans was October 2021 um, or November 2021. Um, I don't feel like we had uh, much exploration of the city. Usually on these on these shows, the city kind of becomes not just backdrop, but also like part of the storytelling. And I didn't feel like we really understood New Orleans. I started to get a perspective of New Orleans through a friendship that I made there. I was on the show with, um, I made a friend with an, a local artist at the time, Lionel Milton. He and I have remained friends over the past 20 years. So I started to learn about New Orleans through his lens. Mm -hmm. And it was so much different than the one that we lived in because we lived in tourist New Orleans. You know, like we went to the French Quarter, we did Mardi Gras, we got on a float. Like we lived in a fantastic kind of New Orleans. Like there was an episode where we were in Anne Rice's house. Like that's, that's that doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, going back was really interesting post Katrina, especially because the city has changed so much, like so much of it felt the same, but different. I couldn't really explain it. I, I too love New Orleans and um, spent a little bit of extra time there after the filming with my husband, you know, oh, just good. eating and, and exploring. And it is, it's wonderful. And there's no place like it. No, there is no place like it in the United States. Yeah. Um, so the, when you filmed the first time you were there, what, five months? Yeah. How long was this filming process for homecoming? Uh, including the quarantine that we had a week before moving into the house. It was about three and a half weeks. So you guys filmed for two weeks. Yep. Okay. Do we know how many episodes this is going to be? I've been told eight. Okay. 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 I still can't wrap my head around this five grand for the whole season. <laughs> Because girl, me too. <laughs> because I heard you say somewhere like you should have Snooky money at this time. Like, what happened? But what happened contractually between the real world and Jersey Shore, which happened years later? What transpired where suddenly they were throwing money at people? I too am very curious about that. But we came off of the show, and Survivor had become a thing. And there was a real fear factor had become a thing. So there was a real like competitive edge added to reality TV. So it was no longer like documentary style sitting around and talking. Um, but then the Hills came on mm -hmm. and Jersey Shore came on. But what they changed was they filmed these people over and over and over again. So while we only have one season, they have three and four and five seasons. And, and just like the Housewives franchise, as long as you are giving them television, you can, you know, earn your peach and keep coming back. So I think that changed. But also, I didn't fully understand kind of the soap opera aspect of The Hills. Because keep in mind, we were young. We were also watching MTV, watching our show, and them watching us. Like, anybody that watched The Hills would also know who... Danny, Kelly, Jamie, Matt, they would know who we were, but these people were on red carpets and we weren't. So it was really a very strange juxtaposition. And I can't lie and say I wasn't bitter. Um, <laughs> Chris and Cavallari definitely has cash from well, yeah. the same experience that I had. It's very strange, but yeah. it's also a timing thing. I think everything about my life since real world has always been very close, but no cigar. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I want to get into like your time on girls behaving badly and like what happened after. Um, but very quickly, because I, I was because Nat, listen, I was the person who digging through the dark web, like through Reddit threads for all these years, trying to find clips. <laughs> I will watch a janky daily motion video till the end of time to like catch glimpses. That was, that was me. Um, and so now, that it's, now, <laughs> so now that it's on Paramount plus, finally, I'm truly rewatching like full length episodes of the show. And very early on in the show, you talk about how no one would believe that you were black and you say it's 
it is a part of your identity, whether people believe it or not. And that when you when you would try dating black guys, you weren't black enough for them. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting trying to have a nuanced conversation as a biracial woman who presents a certain way. So I've learned along the way um, where and how to have that conversation um, in terms of when I can take up space and when I can't and when an issue is 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 mine to carry and when it's not based specifically on you know things like colorism and things like presentation so i didn't have the language then to explain that and so looking at it and watching it back it kind of feels cringy because i know what i mean and i'm trying to have a nuanced conversation about race but i'm also failing to understand that when people perceive me they perceive me as, you know, Asian or some kind of ambiguous because black is not at the, what their idea of black is not at the forefront. And this is before we were having conversations about black is not a monolith and, you know, how people can identify. This was before there were Rachel Dolezal's and all of that. So Mariah Carey writing nearly an entire book about this, about her experience. Listen, Mariah Carey is one of my, well, I don't even say one of, she is the, like, she's my when she came out, even just lyrically, the things she was saying, and then when her book came out, it just all came full circle. She understands my experience very much. And I view Mariah Carey as a Black woman, regardless of whether or not other people do. And so um, I figured out along the ways that, you know, it's really not how I'm perceived is not my issue. If it's a part of my identity, because I grew up in a household where, you know, it was pretty Black. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> then that's, yeah. you know, who I am and, and, and you will accept me as such. So watching those early episodes and, and revisiting that was kind of weird just because the trope of like tragic mulatto, I didn't love that. But still, I think as a 22 year old sharing my views on race, listen, I was pretty smart for a little kid. I wasn't doing bad. <laughs> and so was this the stuff when you uh, you mean every real world real world or of note then goes on they graduate from the real world and they graduate on to sort of a college speaking tour and I know you were paired with Danny a lot Danny was paired with Genesis a lot all my favorites were paired together <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know they would have you know Danny would be talking about don't ask don't tell you know the issues because this is back when the show was good and like sort of issue based yeah. were you relegated to just talking about race and like did you have the opportunity to talk about colorism um no i was mostly talking about you know how to be an anti-racist keep in mind too i was talking about this stuff not knowing that it was the stuff you know like we didn't have some of the labels that we have now and some of the terminology that we have now i was doing it but i didn't know i was doing it i was 22 years old on there trying to talk about white privilege like that not that it was as groundbreaking as something like, you know, don't ask, don't tell, but like, that was crazy. That was kind of like revolutionary. Yeah. Go me. <laughs> so how does, does MTV set you up on these college tours? Like who assigns you that like, okay, you're going to be paired with Danny. Like who organizes all that stuff? Uh, Danny and I at the time had the same speaking um, engagement agent who I'm still friends with to this day. He came to my wedding. Um, we have drinks. He knows my husband. So I still am very close friends with um, my original speaking agent, who was my only speaking agent. Mm -hmm. um, so Danny and I were hooked up all the time because we were a requested together to talk about these issues, mm -hmm. which, you know, the reality is I can imagine a lot of college kids that are on like their student boards saying we want to bring in an MTV person and they had to package it as, oh, well, they're going to talk about issues, but really they wanted to know about real world, which was fine. So we would top load it 15 minutes about, you know, an educational topic, but then the rest of it would be like, what was it like wearing the microphones all day? Did you really, did they go in the bathroom with you? Did they see you take showers? Did such and such hook up with such and such? So mm -hmm. um, it was really kind of smoke and mirrors, but we did, you know, get the work done and man, what a time I, I traveled and I saw so much of the United States by, um, having the opportunity to, to go to college lectures. That was crazy. What a time. I know that you wound up having sort of like a rift with Julie and it had to do something related to a speaking engagement. Like she had like underhanded tactics. Was that about money? Like what was going on? On paper, it is about money, but emotionally it was about friendship for me. Mm -hmm. 
because uh, in that house, I believed that I had a true and real friendship with her. If you watch the show, you, you see our friendship budding. And even, you know, we were having hard conversations and I just saw a clip recently and was like, wow, you've taught me so much in just this one conversation more than I've been taught in high school and college. And I was like, wow, this is a formative relationship for her and me. I felt a true connection. So when all of that behind the scenes stuff started to unravel, it, 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 it came to my attention um, in between the ending of the filming and the going on the battle of the sexes. So that's why the viewing audience sees our friendship mm -hmm. in the real world house. And then they see a non-friendship in Jamaica at the battle of the sexes, because there was two years in between there where all of this stuff was brewing. And I had only just discovered it prior to coming to Jamaica. Got it. My elevated sense of upset about it was really rooted. And I don't think they ever got the storytelling right. It was really rooted in, dude, we were friends. Like, that wasn't cool. Who does that? But like, so what did she do? Like, block you from getting a gig? Um, I did a whole... Oh, wow. I wrote it out. There were timestamps and emails and all that where I explained exactly how it happened, what schools it happened at. Um, oh, damn. And then okay. I went on with my life. It was one of those things where she's always going to be, she and I are always going to have shared space, you know, because we were on the show together, but I addressed it at that time. And, and then I didn't speak her name again, ever again. So after I said my piece about what it was, because, you know, you do the show and then everybody talks about it in the message boards. And finally you just have to say, okay, this is really what happened. After I put that on the internet, it, it lived on the internet. She said what she had to say. We never spoke again. So the first time I ever saw her after Jamaica was coming into that New Orleans house. And keep in mind, Danny and I had lost touch. Mm -hmm. So even though we had the same agent, he kept what happened with him largely to himself. I kept what happened to me largely to myself. Because if you watch the challenge, I say, keep your my name out of your mouth. That applied to me too. I never talked about the lady again. So hearing the full scope of what happened to Danny, I was like, dang. Okay. Well, because I know that both, you know what, before we get into the PTSD, let's, let's lighten this up for a second. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, okay, so cut to, you wind up moving to LA and you got an agent and they are gassing you up saying you're going to be a breakout comedy star. Yeah. You join the Groundlings, which is the breeding ground. I actually just interviewed Sherry O'Terry from SNL, and she talks all about how the Groundlings, like her dream wasn't to be on SNL. Her dream was to be a Groundling. And yeah. so many people came out of the Groundlings. Jennifer Coolidge, um, Kristen Wiig, Maya, uh, maybe not, yeah, Maya Rudolph, like everybody great from SNL that's sort of character-based, um, plus so many actresses. Who was in your class at the Groundlings? Me. Well, in terms of other famous people, I was the most famous person in that troupe at the time. <laughs> um, so um, I left the show, yes, definitely was gassed up. And I went actually on, at the time, the Craig Kilborn show. Mm -hmm. Remember that one? Oh, yeah. Oh, I used to love him. So I went on the Craig Kilborn show and just jokingly... Uh, said, hey, um, I just moved to LA. I don't have a job. I need one. And a producer from the Jamie Foxx show contacted my agent and was like, um, she can come work here. And so here I am thinking, oh my gosh, I just got an on-camera job by asking. It wasn't an on-camera job. It was a PA job. But listen, you got to get in where you fit in. So I took the lowliest job at the Jamie Foxx show, which was a wonderful opportunity because that was a writer's room that I was able to like, you know, creep on and see um you know how that kind of stuff works and while i was a pa on the jamie fox show i was also doing stand-up and i was doing groundlings and so you know i got into the grind of things i went on auditions i was making my reel of all these characters that i had i had a filipino character that i was doing and i got super into it for two or three years you know chasing that sort of comedy thing but also i felt like i wasn't really understood I was really just the little girl from real world and I was like no 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 you're not understanding this is the other so if you read my blog you could tell like there was a nuanced version of me that I would share with the world but I I, I don't it, it was a mix between maybe I wasn't all the way ready and maybe they were not ready so wait, you're saying like nobody that you encountered on the groundlings like went on to like 
because usually there's one or two breakout people who wind up becoming huge stand-ups or they graduate to SNL or they get a show. Like it was like dark days at Groundlings. Well, my particular grounding Groundlings class didn't have anybody, but I ended up working with a lot of people who went on to do amazing things. So Chelsea Handler was on Girls Behaving Badly mm -hmm. and she was not even doing stand-up at the time that um, I met her and then she was got into stand up and then, you know, her career went on a whole trajectory. I met Ken Jeong on the set of Girls Behaving Badly one day. Um, Chandrella Avery, who went on to star in the iconic hit uh, Napoleon Dynamite. Mm -hmm. um, so I did cross paths with a lot of one of my favorite stories to tell is um, I ended up on Maxim's Hot 100 list. I was number 91. And guess who was number 92? So there's only 100 of us. We were in the 90s. Guess who was number 92? Jenny McCarthy. Eva Longoria, who the next year shot all the way up to number one, oh. Oh. playing a desperate housewife. And by the time she was on the front cover of the, that magazine, I had moved to Long Island and become an actual housewife. So that was. <laughs> oh my God. That's fine. So, like I, so it goes along with the theme of close but no cigar, which has been my life. <laughs> Was there anything you, well, actually, you know what, t talk to me about, so you, you were trying to do stand-up. Were you doing characters on stage or were you literally like telling stories? Like what was your stand-up like? I was doing like slice of life stuff. I was doing, you know, day in the life of a, a D-list reality star, mm -hmm. what it's like to be famous but broke. Um, you know, I at the time, Jackass was a really huge hit. So I had a whole thing that I had set up and it was so amazing where I incorporated storytelling about my parents, blah, blah, blah. And this actually really happened. And I remember sitting in my tiny studio apartment with my dad and Jackass was on in the background as we were waiting for real world to come on um, a marathon. And my dad was like, they sure wouldn't have a show called black ass because black motherfuckers ain't doing that. And I, I worked that into my stand up, and that used to kill, honestly. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, Stand up is also like such a skill set that if you don't have like the stomach for it, if you don't have the balls for it, the audacity for it, you're not going to make it. And I was still very young and green. I had so much fun doing it. I had a little, a couple little showcases here and there. Um, but, you know, all of that life experience kind of fueled my writing. So I got really hardcore into, you know, essays and storytelling that way so it's kind of come full circle when homecoming called me I was actually just wrapping up my first pilot script that I wrote based on me so it's a it's far-fetched I know but uh no but that's amazing former reality star turned shut in uh you know but it's there's blacks there's Asians there's Jews yeah because I converted um Anyway, yes, I actually before this, I was looking up, um, f I was Googling your husband and I, I know he's a musician and I saw your wedding pictures. I had never like Googled your husband and I'm like, oh, my God, he's wearing a yarmulke. Like I, I you, so you converted to Judaism. Yes. So we were married for three years before I converted. I converted on my own. So I didn't convert to marry him. It just was one of those things where I spent so much time with you know, his family and with the friends of his family. And I also lived on Long Island and, you know, on Long Island, you got to have, you got to have a bagel allegiance. You got to have a temple allegiance. There's all these things. So I was learning. Honey, so much I'm from this. I'm from the South shore. I wait, do, oh. you, live, do you live in Merrick? Where do you remind I, me? I, I used to live in Merrick. Yeah. Okay. South so, shore is where my Long Island beginnings. <laughs> I'm from, I, my whole family's in Long Beach and I, I grew up in Oceanside, like Rockville Center. Yes, uh, so Oceanside like, Rockville Center. Yeah. I know where you are. I know who you are. Yeah, you know the Long Island six, Railroad whoop, whoop. stop. Yes. <laughs> um, so being on Long Island, it wasn't, it was, it's really hard to explain the thing about Judaism because Judaism is more of a, for me, it's less of a religion and more of a, a vibe and uh, a feeling and a lifestyle um, that you bring to your children. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like I want my children to have the upbringing that he had. So, you know, I want them to become bat mitzvah. I want them to, um, you know, go to Hebrew school and all that. And so I converted and then Hurricane Sandy happened and I was in the middle of like Hebrew lessons, whatever. And I was going to become bat mitzvah around that time. And then 
life happens. I had a bunch of babies. And then now my oldest daughter's 13 and she's, you know, at that time that she can, we are taking Hebrew classes together and we're going to become bat mitzvah together. Of course, she doesn't want to do the party with me. She doesn't like my theme. We're fighting about our themes. That's but, um... <laughs> amazing. That actually reminds, this is so fucking random and you may not even know what I'm talking about. Did you happen to watch and just like that, the Sex in the City revival? I didn't, but I know someone's Jewish there, right? No, literally in the finale, Char- I mean, you've seen Sex in the City, right? Okay, so like Charlotte's daughter, I may have to cut this out. Charlotte's daughter is is refusing to get up on stage to do the bat mitzvah. And so Charlotte, who never had the bat mitzvah, gets it. And she winds up being bat mitzvah. So it's reminding me like, oh, they did this. Yeah, that's yeah. literally a slice of my life. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> go, um, wa- go watch the the finale of And Just Like That, you will get a kick out of it because based on what you just described, because it's literally yeah. what you're describing. Yeah, that's that's exactly my actual life. That's crazy. Yeah, so yeah. I, I converted and I live a very Long Island suburban life and I, I truly enjoy it. I do. How did you get the gig on Girls Behaving Badly? Because you were acting on that. Like you just auditioned and like, it's an unknown Chelsea Handler. Like, is that what it was? It was just an audition? At the time they were, at the time it was Oxygen Network when it was still under Oprah. So they were looking for an all female driven comedy show in the style of, of pranks. So you had to actually send in bits. So, you know, I had a whole sizzle reel of all these characters that I created and I got in the door. Um, I booked it, which was, you don't book stuff. Like that doesn't happen. Like it's so, it's hard to explain to people how hard it is to book something in LA. It just doesn't Mm -hmm. happen. It was a total lottery ticket. So I booked it and I originally was in so many of the skits, but then because real world is what it is, I was extremely famous from real world. And so when I'm with a mark and we've spent a lot of money producing this skit for today uh, and they're like, hold on, how are you Debbie from the flower shop if you're Melissa from the real world? So I started like ruining the marks. So they put me more of in a hosting role in like Mm. the subsequent seasons. So that show went on for five seasons. It was really great run. It was a really great way for me to hone my, my, my humor, my written humor stuff, you know, because I had to like give ideas and stuff. And then also it was a way for me to really practice on camera hosting. And then I got into voiceover work from that too. So Mm. that was a really good opportunity uh, for me. And the producers of that show went on to, they do crazy big stuff on TV now. I wonder if they remember me. Very (laughs) positive. What was was like an unknown Chelsea Handler like? You're saying this was before she was doing stand-up? When when I met her on that show, I had never seen her stand-up yet. And, you know, she and Chandrella were both doing stand-up. So like they would come to the set, they would Mm -hmm. do their thing. And then they'd be like, oh, we're going to be at, you know, such and such room tonight. Um, yeah, she was Chelsea Handler. She was her. She's exactly her. What was she talking? Like, do you remember anything that she would be like talking about on stage? Like what her act was like in those very early days? Like, do you remember anything? Um, no, but I, you know, vodka. (laughs) Yes, of course. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Belvedere is kind of her brand. Yeah. She was, listen, she was, she was exactly who she is. She was Chelsea Handler. And I think, um, she had a bit in there because I think she was part Jewish. She's yes. Somebody's Jewish she, and somebody's Jewish. Mormon. Yes. She is part Jewish and Mormon. Yes. Yes. So that was in her work. Yeah. I remember all of that. This, it, I mean, listen, it was such a, you know, when you're in it, you don't understand what you're looking at, you know? Mm-hmm. So it was such a, and like just seeing it reflected back on me. I, I mean, it, really what was so interesting was to see her uh, start doing work in like the social space of like how to be an anti-racist and stuff that Mm -hmm. blew my mind because you know with time yeah now people learn things and then they get a platform and they they and now she's dating joe coy but i'm like my mom you know you know filipino mom will keep tabs on every single person they've ever met (laughs) if they have even just a tiny brush of fame i'm like yes go yay filipinos (laughs) Uh, was there anything you auditioned for at that time that you didn't get that wound up being a huge project or wound up being like a huge show or a huge movie. And you were like, fuck, like I auditioned for that and I didn't get it. And that could have like been my career. Yes. And I'm still to this day so upset about it. I can't, I can't, I can hardly talk about it. It's going to, it's going to sound so stupid, but I auditioned to be the yellow ranger. 
um, on like Power, Power Rangers. Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> I had a call back and everything. I was very close. The The call to reject me was really sad. They're like, we really love you, Melissa. And, you know, we're just going to go a different direction. And like, that was actually the kind of fame I was hoping to have where it's, you're in a mask, nobody knows it's you. And then, you know, you have your few speaking parts, but who's really watching this? Little kids are watching this, but it's also steady work for years and years and years and years, and then it gets syndicated. Mm -hmm. So whoever the Yellow Ranger is now, I'm sure she has a lovely life somewhere in Vermont and she has, you know, television is in the rear view of her life, but she's paid. And like, that's what I really wanted. I also got really close on, do you remember the TV guide had a channel? And there was a little lady that stood at the top yes. and she would tell you what's coming on next because you couldn't go on the internet to find out what time Golden Girls came on. I auditioned for that and I wanted it so bad. <laughs> I didn't get that one. And then, you know, the TV guide ended up going the way of the dodo bird. But what a time. How did you meet your <laughs> husband? My, I actually needed an online store and I was his third client ever. He had a company called Merch Direct and he was doing making merch and selling it direct to the customer. This wasn't a thing at the time. And then we got together after my store dwindled down, you know, after they, we would run real world marathons over and over and over again. So I started selling the artwork um, that I made on the show. And then um, a couple of years later, we got together and I've been with him for 17 years. I'm wow. Crazy. That's amazing. I've been together a long time. And I actually listened to his band before I knew he was his band. I was like, oh, hold on. You're glass jaw. Cool. I like that band. She's like, no, you don't. I was like, yes, I do. I contain a multitude. You don't know what I like. <laughs> <laughs> so cut to you get the call. Like what happened? You get a phone call one day from like, you get a call from Buna Murray saying they they they're going with New Orleans as the next homecoming season like what was that phone call like yeah let's just start there I want to go through yeah. your because I know that you actually consulted with our mutual friend Andy Bellotti astrologer to the stars I did he talked me off a ledge I know he I actually thank Andy Bellotti because without his reading I really would not have gone that's the truth so talk to me so this is super interesting so what do they say to you on the phone and then I want to know what your what was your apprehension that led you to contacting Andy again for another reading or like to consult with him about actually going through with this? So what happened is I, I, I watched Real World LA or Real World New York. I watched Real World LA and like I knew just from reading the trades that I, it had gotten picked up for a third season. Um, you know, I'm nosy like that. I'd be reading for right. I don't even know what I'm looking at, but I'd be reading all that. So I knew they were going to have to do another season. Did I think they were going to jump all the way to nine? No. But I also felt like I know enough about what it is to be a real world person. And I know enough about every person's kind of weird relationship with their existence on that show that there was no way they were going to get seven people to agree because the, the whole premise, the entire time that we went through this process, they said all seven have to go or else we're not doing the show. So they called us to see our availability, but they said that we were in the running with Boston, Hawaii, Seattle, something like that. But they were really vague, very Buna Murray MTV. So, you know, it was a little bit of information trickled here and there. And I wasn't, I don't talk to other real worlders like that. So I couldn't call, you know, like Cyrus and be like, what they say to you? I don't, I don't know these mm -hmm. people like that. So I was just sitting here like, I mean, if they call, they call, but I don't think I want to do that because I, I very much value my privacy. And also I am not camera ready. They ended up calling us, this process took about a year. They ended up calling us in, I want to say July, August. And we're like, congratulations, New Orleans is the new homecoming. And I was like, oh, really? Who said no? Because I just couldn't mm -hmm. understand why they would go to us. And they were like, oh, no, no, we really want you. And I was like, okay, but you really wanted someone else who like, <laughs> don't play with me. And they're like, no, it's really going to be you. And I was like, mm. and then we started getting to, through that contract phase and I was just like, you know what? And it was just deja vu. It was like, oh, I remember this contract. Wait, there's <laughs> no way it was the five grand again. Now, no, no, no. I'm praying you got oh, the Snooki money this for time. For sure. I mean, listen, it was gonna, first of all, it's a pandemic and you, I, I, I'm, I'm a, I love a mask, I love a vaccine. So I was like, I am not leaving the house without no real money on the table, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, like, what are we really talking about? How much time is this going to be? Where is it going to be showing? Like I had a lot of trepidation about it only because 
I went on a reality TV show. I was very famous. I was very broke. And now I have a really happy private life. So this conversation, this decision was not one to be made lightly. But I also, you know, was curious. I also was in a space where I said, and this is where Andy comes in. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to do it. And every now and again, you know, I would hear rumblings that, well, such and such just signed on, such and such just signed on. And, and it was getting close to the, to the, the deadline. And I was like, mm. and like, even though I, I was not connected to these people in the past 20 years, you also have a weird loyalty to them. So it's kind of like, well, if they want to do it and they're going to do it, who am I to like take this opportunity away from them? Because you don't want to be the person in the cast that ruins it for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, especially yeah. if you guys haven't spoken and I don't know where people are financially or whether or not they need it. I, I wanted to stay home. I really did. Um, but then it started to be kind of like, I have a, a responsibility to kind of honor what real world means to the viewing audience. You know, it's such a, and it was hard for me to wrap my brain around that. It was like, Melissa, yes, you have done a lot of therapy. You've done a lot of work to not be Melissa from the real world. It's been 20 years. Nobody's tripping off that you're fine. You're going to be fine, but you also belong to the world as Melissa from the real world. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. People love the show. They love the franchise. They loved MTV at that time. If you're going to go, you need to get your head on right. You need to be present and you need to take this as an opportunity and as a blessing instead of you know, as an obstacle to, uh, you know, I didn't want to go in with hesitation and like remorse. I wanted to go in and be like, you know what, let's have fun. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it fully. And I'm going to have fun. I'm going to be my most authentic self. And I'm going to hope to God that they have nuanced storytelling. That's so, all. So I what do. did Andy, so you call up Andy and like, what did he say to you? Like what were, what is... Andy pulled my chart up. You know how he does. Of he course. said, hold on. He got to clicking and clacking. <laughs> And um, he pulled my chart up and he said, Melissa, there's a lot going on here. If, and I think you should walk through this door, your stars are aligning in such a way that I think that you are in your celestial space to do this. And it sounds crazy to people that don't follow that stuff, but like he read me down mm -hmm. and he was just like, you have gifts and you have certain qualities about you that this feels hard. And, and, and it feels strange and it feels out of body, but you're going to have to walk through that door because there are gifts on the other side and, mm. and you got it. You got to walk through that door to get them. And I was like, or do you just want to see the show, Andy? You know, um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was probably 20% it. <laughs> but he really, I, it, astrology and, and you're, you know, people, if you don't follow it, you don't get it. And I know people think it's a bunch of hullabaloo, but like he got it down to, you know, my time of birth and, and where I was born and all of mm -hmm. that. And he showed me on the thing. And he, I saw it with my own two eyes that it was going to be a good thing for me and that I was going to be safe and that I would come out of this as a fuller and, and more whole person. And I would have, for me, that felt like, okay, this will be me closing the gap and fully healing from that experience. Not mm -hmm. that it was so bad that I needed healing, but you know what I mean? Like it was yeah. a big, it was a big time in my life that had to be processed. So I said, you know what? Fuck it. Let's do it live. And I went. <laughs> I love it. And so, I mean, I guess, I guess that's really, I mean, is there anything else you want to say? I feel like we've covered so much ground. I mean, I can't thank you enough. Like I've loved chatting with you. I mean, thank are you, you I love chatting with you. Are you excited to see it? play out and like is there like what would be your greatest hope like okay this thing airs and what maybe your pilot gets made as a result listen it's a long shot it is it's 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 a long shot but I never stopped writing mm -hmm. um I, I I've always been into storytelling and the few meetings that I've had to sell this thing have been one of the questions that they always ask is why are you the only person in the world to tell the story? And I'm like, Oh, well, do you know any other half black, half Filipino, former reality stars married to a Jewish guy? Do you know who I am? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm the person to tell the story. Very quickly. You you're so funny on Twitter. Talk to me about how you won't show your elbows or, or wait, you're very into <laughs> turtlenecks and you won't, you're like, you can look, try and find my elbow, but you will never see my elbow on, <laughs> on homecoming. Walk me, 
Walk me through this. I mean, we went through your teeth journey. I want to hear about your elbow and your turtleneck journey. Listen, you are also looking very young and there's a way to do that. I mean, you might actually have a, a, a beautiful wrinkle-free neck and, and, and really nice smooth elbows. But if you don't, you have to hide those things because those things will betray you. It's tops of hands, <laughs> necks, and elbows, kneecaps too. If people see those and your face is looking 35, but they see that and that's looking 85, they're starting to do the math and get meeting somewhere in the middle and they know that you're a 60 year old woman. So there are just, you know, tips and tricks outside of Spanx that you need to do to remain youthful. And it's have, um, you know, unfortunately it's have designer glasses. It's keep your neck mostly covered. It's hide them elbows. It's uh, don't wear capri pants. Um, <laughs> You know, nobody should be wearing tricks. who wears capri pads people do wow awful. well you um, know what's so funny you know Nora Ephron like she wrote like when Harry met Sally she wrote a memoir titled I feel bad about my neck yeah see it's a re- listen I do too and that's why you know I, I I literally curl this and flip this to sit like that <sighs> listen Melissa Beck your teeth look amazing your Thank elbows you. and your neck look amazing. <laughs> Tell everybody where they can find you, where to listen to your podcast, everything. Yes. So you can find me on my blue check social media. I hope they don't take my blue check away because I've been <laughs> Melissa from the real world for 44 years and tried to tell Twitter that. I was like, no, I really am her. They didn't believe me. It took Paramount to make them give me a blue check. So I'm on Twitter at Melissa R W N O Twitter is I I love Twitter I think you are you hilarious know, this is I am with, listen I am strongly you. endorsing this follow <laughs> and I don't like thank ever you. say I don't ever say that but like you, I, I mean just the teeth alone at the top and the head <laughs> so that's my Twitter you can follow me on Instagram it's Melissa Beck R W N O 